Well, who knows? Technology, eh? <laughs> it was all working perfectly yesterday when we did a dry run. So I'm sorry about that glorious introduction that suddenly collapsed on me terribly. So I do apologize. Um, anyway, we have got people diving into the live stream from all over the place. Uh, let me uh, just show you. Uh, uh, he says, going over to the queue. So we've got uh, Christian... Um, Feldman from uh, Germany, and we've got Dominique from um, Belgium. He's come in. Uh, Mark Jan Dunmans, uh, who's watching from the UK. Jay from Dartmoor. Dave Fowler from South Gloucester. Hey, we've got somebody watching from New Zealand too. Hi, Wayne. Thanks for joining us. And of course, Roman, who is a fan of the show. Uh, and he's uh, obviously watching from Germany. So, welcome everybody, and welcome to everybody else that's on the live stream. It's picking up nicely. We've got 20 plus at the moment watching, and I'm sure that'll increase over time. Uh, so if you're watching live, that's great. If you're watching the recorded show, once they have tidied up the beginning, uh, that'll be good too. And if you're listening to the podcast, I'm sure you're going to find this really, really interesting. But there's going to be a lot of pictures shown during uh, this, uh, this uh, interview. So if you can get time, grab yourself a cup of tea and uh, sit down and watch this at a later stage. So, um, Grandma Gatewood, yes, it's a name that's been banded around and many people in the international lightweight scene know the name. Uh, I first came across her name when I read this book by Ray Jardine, uh, Beyond Backpacking, which is like the uh, Backpacker's Bible. I read this about 25 years ago. And I'm sure everybody knows the gist of the story. A 67-year-old woman in 1955 goes for a 2,000-mile walk, uh, becomes the first person to walk the length of the Appalachian Trail, and she did it on a lightweight basis, as we call it today. But in her day, well, it was more like necessity. So um, today I have the pleasure of um, going deeper into the story and into the backstory completely with, uh, of Emma Gatewood, or Grandma Gatewood, as we better know her. Uh, the person that she was, uh, why she holds such a justified iconic position in history, and how her legacy is still affecting lives of those heading outdoors today. Uh, with Perlitzer Prize finalist and author of her New York Times best-selling biography, Ben Montgomery. Good evening, Ben. How are you? How are you doing? Ah, that's great. You can hear us okay? Sure enough. Excellent, excellent. So, um, nice to have you aboard, Ben. Thank you very much indeed for taking the time in uh, what is your afternoon, isn't it? It's about two o'clock in the afternoon in the US. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to delving into the story and some of the, the backstory of, uh, of Grandma Gatewood. So, first Thank of all, let's you. just start with your relationship because you have a fairly unique perspective to have written this story. Sure enough, I was a newspaper reporter at the Tampa Bay Times here in Florida and um, wrote a story that got a lot of attention, um, not about hiking or about the outdoors, but it wound up in the hands of a literary agent in New York who called and said, do you have any book ideas? And I, I did. This was sort of every you know, young writer's dream, uh, but it fell into my lap. Uh, my mother used to tell me stories, uh, bedtime stories, about this distant relative of ours who was the first woman to solo through hike the Appalachian Trail. And uh, I only knew a little about her, some sort of uh, stories of her adventures. Um, Mom used to tell me that somewhere in the Pacific Northwest, she scared off a black bear with her umbrella. Um, she was just this character that existed that... that uh, you know, I was always fond of, but uh, when it came, you know, when I had this opportunity to do a book, I started looking around and nobody had given her serious biographical treatment. She shows up in books like, uh, like you just referred to in Larry Luxemburg's, Luxemburg's uh, um, book of vignettes about Appalachian Trail pioneers and a few others. Um, so I thought, well, now it's time to take a deep dive into her life and figure out who this woman really was and uh, in a way try to solidify her mark on uh, American hiking, on hiking in general, um, and her impact specifically on the Appalachian Trail, the preservation of the people's path, as my shirt uh, calls it. Well, she certainly became one of the most famous pedestrians, I think, in the US uh, during that period. And, and obviously her legacy lives on. Uh, but she lived through very turbulent times, didn't she? The, I mean, she was born in the late 1880s. Um, and so she went through, you know, a whole series of, 
of uh, historical moments that must have been pretty hard going. Oh, sure. Yeah. And uh, it got them listed there, but let's march right through them. Um, you know, this was not an easy period of time to, to, be, uh, to be a woman, uh, to be a mother, to be a grandmother in, in the United States of America. She, of course, lived through the First World War. Uh, her own father had been um, had, had fought in the uh, uh, Revolutionary War. Um, she was, um, you know, she was married uh, around the age of 18. So really, um, you know, re really early. She married a 28 year old man, but she, um, she lived through the Spanish flu. We're kind of dealing with some of that right now with the uh, pandemic that's that spread across the world. Um, and, and by the way, she was she was birthing kids about one every year or two for the first uh, for the first couple of decades of her marriage. She wound up giving birth to 11 living children, had a couple of miscarriages. But, uh, you know, that that was um, um, more common at the time, primarily because especially in that area of southeastern Ohio, uh, which is known kind of as the Midwest. But it butts up against the Appalachian Mountains, which run up the eastern seaboard of the United States. Um, and, uh, and she, she was a farm woman. She married a, a, a guy who was a school teacher, but also a farmer. And they started having these kids primarily to take care of the jobs on the farm. Um, you know, the, the, the market crashed as you've got, as you've got mentioned there, Black Friday, 1929, October of 1929. And that sent the economy here in the U S into a tailspin. Of course it was tailspinning in other parts of the world, but it led to, uh, what we call the Great Depression, and this was a period in American history where a quarter of the American population was completely out of work, um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 8 million men and women, sometimes children, were crisscrossing the country by rail car, uh, looking for employment opportunities, looking for ways to survive. There were, of course, food riots in places like Oklahoma and Arkansas, um, uh, th this was, you know, not an easy time to scrape by. Uh, and she's bringing up, you know, a whole uh, gaggle of children uh, on a farm. It was a very hard scrabble life. Everybody got an assignment, you know, from the time you were uh, two or three years old, you were given chores, sweep the floor, collect the eggs from the chickens. Uh, when you got a little older, maybe they sent you to work in the fields. Um, so th this was uh, this was a tough way to make a living, tough way to eke out a living. But she and and her husband at the time, PC Gatewood, uh, did it. And she, you know, uh, uh, many people told me that she could often be found working from sun up by a kerosene lantern, working in the garden, um, uh, all, all the way until sundown, right next door to right 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 next door to the men uh, that, that her husband had hired. Sure, sure. Uh, well, we're going to come on to her her actual life from school onwards, and obviously some of the stories about her her married life and some of the trials and tribulations that she went through, which which pretty well sets the tone for the type of woman that she became in in many respects. But one thing I have negated to do, and I I do apologise, of course, I haven't uh, I introduced Rose, who is currently in the chat room overseeing the the chat. Say hello to everybody, Rose. You're uh, you're there now. No, hello, Rose. <laughs> hi hi there no, i am here so uh she's uh, she's in the chat room so what we'll be doing is putting links to ben's various books and anything else that uh, we discuss uh, as as time goes by but uh yeah i'd like to really get stuck into to her life because uh, there's a lot to get through in this interview and every section is equally as important as the previous to be honest uh, but let, let's start from, you know, as you started and hinted initially, her, uh, her school life and getting married to PC, which was really the start of things. I, I, I have no idea. There's no mention in your book of what her childhood was like before that, whether it was a happy childhood or a rural childhood. But I presume it was before before she got married and things changed. Yeah, she, you know, for as hard scrabble as her people were at that time, trying to eke out a living in southeastern Ohio, um, she had fond memories of her childhood and had fond memories of both of her parents, but it was often, uh, she went to school, I think we have a photo of this, but she went to school only through the eighth grade, which was um, as high as you could go in terms of 
standard education. And some of her children were under the impression that she had actually repeated the eighth grade a couple of times just to take full advantage of the public schooling that was offered to her. Um, and she was a lifelong reader. She uh, uh, adored uh, reading books and magazines. Um, it was just a part of who she was. In, uh, you know, like I said, when she was 18 years old, she married a, a guy named P.C. Gatewood, who was a school teacher, sometimes bus driver, sometimes a farmer, um, uh, kind of a handyman, well known around the area where they lived in southeastern Ohio. Uh, he was considered a catch. He fancied himself a brilliant man, would often in church, um, you know, when the pastor was finished. He would often stand up and deliver a sermon of his own, even though he wasn't uh, on staff at the church. But he would get up and orate for a couple of hours, uh, you know, after the service had closed. Um, uh, he was also uh, an abusive man. And this was not discovered until uh, by anyone outside of their family until much later. Um, it was kind of a, a family secret. But. Starting early on in their marriage, uh, PC was violent with his wife, with Emma Gatewood, and she described in several diaries that she left behind the beatings that he uh, inflicted upon her. Um, her children told me as well that they remembered uh, their father's short fuse, his temper, his anger. Uh, a couple of them witnessed him beat a horse half to death. Um, now, he never touched the children so far as they said, but but he was violent with Emma on a very regular basis. And so, uh, in fact, she wrote in a diary that she was never pregnant or with child um, when uh, he did not lay hands on her. So, in, in other words, uh, every child that she gave birth to, she took a beating while she was pregnant with that child. Um, Unfortunately, at that time in that part of the world, it was not an easy thing to get divorced. It was not an easy thing to uh, leave a household like this. Uh, she had nowhere to turn. Her family was all, uh, most, most of them had moved to the West Coast, to California. And a couple of times after especially brutal beatings, when the, most of the children were older, um, she left her small town of Galpolis, Ohio, and went to visit family on the West Coast with the idea that she might stay there uh, for a while so that PC Gatewood got the message that she was serious about, le about leaving him. She thought he was going to kill her. And so uh, we know that on two different occasions, she fled for the West Coast, and eventually he was able to convince her to come back home uh, and rejoin the family. So you know, she, she did uh, right, right up until the very end. And I don't know if you want to get, get if you want me to get into this now, Bob, but he delivered a uh, an especially brutal beating in which um, he pulled part of her ear off. Um, he broke a couple of ribs, broke out some teeth. And she thought, if I allow him to do this again, if I stick around, he's going to kill me. And it was around this time that she de decided to file for divorce. This was 1941. And she went to a court a courthouse in West Virginia, uh, filed for divorce from PC Gatewood. He didn't oppose that divorce. He never showed up in court to face uh, the accusations. And so she was granted a divorce and granted a certain settlement for him. And she kind of went on and took, took the, the remaining kids who hadn't yet uh, grown out of the household. She kind of took them and, and um, carried on with her life, living as a single yeah. independent woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you detail a couple of things uh, in, the, in the book here, which I think uh, are worth mentioning. Not that a case I just want to exaggerate the situation, but I think it gives a bit of background and get more depth to, to the woman herself. Um, as I understand it, she was only five foot two, five foot one from the various descriptions that I've picked up. So she was, was a very slight woman. Um, and uh, as you report in the book, there's occasions where the um, PC broke a broom over her head at one stage. Um, she had such a, a heavy beatings that uh, it's just incredible that she was able to withstand it. But as I understand it also, and again, just sort of reading the book again, that was the times that she would also retreat to the sanctuary of the woods and the forest to, to get some peace and hopefully recover in some sort of way, but just get some distance while he cooled down. And I, I presume that began the, 
the healing process. But I'd like you to just complete the story you almost started there about the time that um, uh, the last time that he beat her when she was, I think, 51, roughly. So uh, and as she stated that um, he, he beat her senseless 10 times that particular 1938, I think it was. Um, and then tell us what happened next. Yeah, a little bit more context. Theirs was a very difficult relationship. And, um, you know, depending on who you talk to, they all uh, folks who knew them together sort of all saw it in different ways. In fact, one of her nephews um, told me that he remembered a fight when he was a young boy staying at their house. He remembered a fight in which, uh, uh, you know, PC started beating on, on Emma and she ran out the back door and she hid in the back of some kind of a carriage, a horse drawn a buggy of some sort that, that was filled with uh, hay or corn or something like that. And she jumped into the back of it to try to hide and to try to get away from him. And he came, came running out the back of the house and grabbed some sort of farm implement that was leaned up against the wall, um, like a hoe. And one of his farm hands grabbed him and said, you need to leave her alone. You're going to kill her. And she shouted from the back of uh, this hiding place. She said, you leave him alone. This is our fight. Um, so, you know, uh, you get the sense from some of these stories that she was not a person who just rolled over and took this, but in fact fought back, uh, you, you know, defended herself. But when she couldn't and when she was scared, um, she, she left for the woods. She would often retreat to the woods uh, to let him cool down. Um, and she found a certain safe harbor in nature. Sometimes she would stay overnight. Sometimes she would sit upon rocks and write poetry, looking over the banks of the Ohio River. Um, but you get the sense in reading what she what she wrote about these experiences that nature became her refuge. And so it's not surprising then to advance forward a decade or so and find her developing this deep interest to hike the entirety of the Appalachian Trail. Sure, sure. Uh, well, I was uh, wondering if you were going to tell us a story about the time she got arrested, she got beaten, and as a result, oh, sure. she ended up getting arrested. Apologize for that. Uh, yeah, sure enough. So um, they get into a fight. Nobody can remember the exact details of this, but PC had convinced their friends and neighbors that Emma was a crazy person. Uh, and that she deserved to, maybe would often threaten her, if you keep this up, if you keep giving me this attitude, I'm going to have you sent to an insane asylum. And this was no place that any woman wanted to be in uh, the 1930s, 40s, 50s. Um, and so uh, it, it sort of kept her quiet, at least changed the way that people who lived around them thought about her and thought about their relationship. And he had done a good job of convincing also the local authorities that she was crazy. And so one day uh, they get into a fight. He beats her up real bad, uh, goes off and returns to the house with a friend of his who was something like a justice of the peace, a constable in that uh, in, in that area. And he came back and he was fully ready to arrest Emma. Well, when PC walked through the door, she hurled a sack of flour that connected squarely with his face and kind of exploded uh, into his face. And, and just beyond that, the, the guy that PC had brought uh, took Emma into custody and put her in jail in a place called Barker's Ridge, West Virginia, where she stayed at least one night before she was uh, given an audience with the mayor of this small town. And she convinced him that she was, in fact, a battered spouse and that, um, you know, prison jail is not a place for her. And he saw through the charade. He knew that this was a battered spouse. And so this um, kind mayor of this small town actually got her employment at a local cafe, got her out of jail, set her up with a place to live. And this set her on her path toward fully breaking away from PC and, and you know, uh, filing for divorce. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, as it happens, I've got a, a my, my mother divorced in the 40s, 50s, I think it was. And she was yeah. telling me just what a social per, a social uh, leper she became. Nobody wanted to speak to her. She was the talk of the town. She had to move away from wherever she was. It really was a, a socially 
charged thing to do and and very very shocking and i think we've got a picture here of uh, of her just after her her divorce which i understood from again reading the book was the time she said she started to enjoy life again and and uh, and the children reflected on that yeah that's exactly right i, I think um she really started to find herself with that new uh, level of independence where she wasn't at the beck and call of an abusive, hard-fisted, oppressive husband who had convinced everybody else that she was crazy. Uh, once she was outside of that, then she um, started to become a, a, you know, a woman in full. She did what she wanted to do. And often that meant, um, you know, uh, 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 work, but it also meant visiting friends on foot. It meant taking trips into the woods. It meant testing herself against the earth uh, with the idea that someday she might have the ambition to walk a long distance. Uh, and, and, that's what, and that's what she did. And you start to see uh, in some of the poetry that she left behind, you start to see her really embrace um, her role as a citizen, but also as a, as a human in that period. She would write these very um, uh, lovely uh, poems about um, you know, the wildflowers that were blooming in the spring or about the bend in the Ohio River or about watching tugboats come up the river and dock there at, at Gallia County. Um, so it was an, a neat moment for her. And you, you really, uh, somebody like me or biography has access to, to this material that she's left behind. You start to see her like really um, come, come out as a full human being, as a full mm -hmm. person with a level of independence that, uh, you know, that we all deserve. Yeah, well, uh, she was also um, uh, born in October. That makes her a Libra, which is usually the sort of the creative uh, star sign. Uh, I would say that because I'm a Libra as well. Um, and uh, we'll come on to one of her poems. We've actually got one of her published poems uh, in the slideshow a bit later on there. But uh, she was very eloquent, uh, considering the sort of life that she'd had, obviously, with PC. But then, of course, there was that moment where she saw the National Geographic. That's right. And nobody is sure when exactly or where exactly she came into contact with this particular issue of the National Geographic. But, uh, you know, we know that it was published in August of 1949. And so perhaps it was sitting around in a doctor's office or something like that. Um, uh, and, it, and she, uh, you know, her, her, her children uh, recall this being the moment when her eyes were open to the idea of uh, the Appalachian Trail. You know, it was a fairly new footpath in August of 1949. I'm saying new because it had just kind of been pieced together and just connected. Of course, it was dreamed up by a guy named Benton Mackay, who stood atop a bluff in uh, somewhere in the northeastern United States and looked south down the, the Blue Ridge of the Appalachian Mountain chain and said, we need to take steps right now to preserve a footpath so that uh, primarily so anybody who lives now at the time, 60 percent of the U.S. population lived along the eastern seaboard. And so he he envisioned a footpath connecting north to south uh, that would be within a day's drive or a day's journey of anybody who wanted to anybody who lived in the area who wanted to just go be in the wilderness and take a long walk um, and so uh, in the late 20s, he, he proposed the idea and trail clubs along the Appalachian Range began to uh, establish themselves and began to work to piece together uh, the People's Path, the Appalachian Trail. And eventually that extended, uh, by 1955, extended um, to about 2,050 miles. It, it started at Mount Oglethorpe in the state of Georgia on the southern end and ran to Mount Katahdin. Uh, in the state of Maine on the northern end. Um, and, uh, it, you know, like I said, it ran close to or within a day's drive of about 60 percent of the U.S. population. So the beauty of that 1949 National Geographic piece is it contains some very um, flowery language. Uh, it contains a bunch of beautiful photos of the trail uh, and it sort of famously says that anybody in moderate physical condition could hayfoot strawfoot from Georgia to Maine uh, without much difficulty. It said the trail was as wide as a Mack truck in many places, and there was food to find along the way, and there were suppliers along the way. And so, um, you know, in retrospect, it created a pretty roseate picture 
of what it might take to walk the entire Appalachian Trail. And there's reason to believe that, uh, you know, Emma set out uh, to do this, thinking this trail would be kind of a walk in the park, that it'd be pretty easy to uh, chip off 2,050 miles and, um, and even fun. And of course, she found that not to be completely the case. So would she be aware of um, Earl Schaffer's or Schaefer's uh, initial trip, do you think? Would she think she knew about that before she started? It's a fine question. You know, Earl Schaefer, who was the first um, person that we know of to, to log a registered through hike, when he completed his in 1948, the ATC, the Appalachian Trail uh, uh, Conservancy, um, doubted his account. Uh, the forefathers of the AT never imagined anybody trying to walk the whole thing in one go. It was just not in the realm of uh, how they how they saw users, um, you, you know, uh, taking advantage of the trail. So he had to actually send in slides and some of his journals to try to prove to the authorities that he had in fact walked the entire thing in one in one season. Um, Schaefer was a World War II veteran. Uh, he wrote about, um, you know, needing to kind of shake off the ghosts of the war, uh, something we probably think of today as PTSD. And of course, a lot of soldiers uh, back from wartime uh, wind up even now on the AT trying to find themselves or trying to put things back together, or figure out who they are, their place in the world. So Earl was the pioneer of that sort. Uh, I think Earl Schaefer had been mentioned in that 49 National Geographic piece. You'd have to check my work on that. But um, but his, uh, the fact that he did this in one go did not make news. Uh, I think it had been noted in the ATC's newsletter that went out to all the members. Um, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a giant deal. It certainly didn't wind up in the New York times or anything like that. I, I actually met in person, the second person to ever complete a through hike, a guy named Gene Espy from Georgia. Oh, really? Um, who I think is still with us, um, although he's, he's way up in years. But Gene did it as a young man. Uh, I think he'd been a former Boy Scout. And um, he told me that there was uh, that his, you know, the second person to complete a solo through hike, Gene Espy, he got one story in the Macon, Georgia newspaper, his hometown newspaper. But outside of that, it wasn't a big deal. Really, until Grandma Gatewood came along. Not many people knew knew about the AT, knew about the history of the AT. Um, uh, this uh, her hikes really introduced Americans at large to the to the trail. Well, certainly, I want to to come on to that and talk about that perhaps towards the end about the impact and the legacy the legacy that she left and other things that have happened uh, since then. Um, sure. But certainly, looking at her approach now we're coming on to obviously her first walk which was wasn't actually in 1955 it was in 1954 and things didn't quite go to plan so would you like to give us a a brief uh, synopsis of, of what happened on on that first trip and and perhaps what she learned from it really what did she gain from that trip because i haven't seen any recorded comments that she learned x y or z about it or she changed her equipment in any particular way and and we'll also come on to her equipment and stuff a bit later on as well sure uh, yeah, so she in 19, she kept this secret, you know, she I feel like she was kind of embarrassed by it. So she didn't tell a lot of people what she had done. But in 1954, she um, a year before she completed her her first solo through hike, uh, she left home and made her way to the north end of the Appalachian Trail uh, and climbed Mount Katahdin, uh, carrying much the same equipment that she carried on her later hikes. Um, as you can see in the photos, she carried a a denim drawstring sack that she had sewn herself at home and inside of it, um, you know, meager supplies, which we can get into later. But she started at Mount Katahdin and she didn't make it but about 100 miles before she got lost in the woods of Maine. Um, and when I say lost, she just completely lost the trail. She had wandered up to the bank of a lake and um, uh, stopped to take a rest. And when she went to collect her things and to set off headed south again, she couldn't find the trail. Uh, she couldn't find it headed south. She couldn't find it headed back to where she had come from. And so this was, you know, if, if you believe what she wrote about this experience, this was a moment when she decided that she had stayed around there for a little while. She started to run out of food. She accidentally stepped on her glasses and broke her glasses. And she was basically blind without, without her glasses. Um, and she, she wrote that, you know, 
she decided if this if I'm going to die, this is as good and as beautiful a place as any. And so she laid down with, with the idea that this was it. This is the end of the road from her for her. And it wasn't she doesn't write about it after the fact in a way that was sad. She had just sort of come to terms with it. Um, after a little while, she decided, you know what, I'm going to give it another shot. By this time, the state park rangers in Maine and Baxter State Park had begun looking for her and they were flying a prop plane overhead. She had seen the plane a couple of times, but she couldn't get anybody's attention. Um, so she decided she would give it one more go and started uh, traipsing through the woods, found the trail that she had lost. And rather than head back south, she decided she would she would um, go back north, uh, restock, rethink, resupply, and, and maybe give it another go at some point. Um, she walked back into uh, the ranger camp at a place called Rainbow Lake. And uh, the, the rangers who had been out looking for her were taking a break and throwing some horseshoes. And when she walked into their camp looking uh, terrible, looking beat up, she had been bitten on the eye by a black fly her glasses were broken. I'm sure she was dirty and, and pretty exhausted. She walked back into camp and they told her, this is no place for a woman your age. You need to go home, grandma. And uh, this hurt her. This was, you know, again, a man telling her what she should and should not be doing. Well, she retreated to her hotel, stayed a night in Bangor, Maine, looked at herself in the mirror, decided, you know what? Uh, it's not over. I'm going to go home this time, but but I'm going to plan a little better and come back next time. Um, and so she started regrouping. And uh, in between 1954 and 1955, she didn't change much in terms of gear. She decided that she would try to go from the south to the north, uh, which is more conducive with the seasons here in the U.S. Um, uh, and uh, but, you know, didn't change much at all in terms of what she brought. She just she didn't tell anybody about that experience until much later, um, but it was it was hurtful for her. She left Maine in defeat, uh, but the kind of defeat that makes you want to hit it again. Um, you've mentioned obviously her diary and her journals, and we've actually got an excerpt of of one to to show people a bit later on. But I'm just uh, curious, as part of your research for doing the book. Did you did you have access to everything? Did you read everything that she had had written? And when did she start writing a journal or a diary? Did she start it when she was with PC, or was that uh, did that come afterwards? This was a pretty common thing for her to keep a journal or a diary. Uh, and her, her youngest daughter Lucy, who became my dear friend, she's a second cousin of mine, I think, but maybe maybe a third cousin. Uh, but we became friends. She's now in her nineties. Um, she lives here in Florida. Anyhow, she kept all of her mother's stuff. And so there were bankers boxes full of, uh, full of journals, diaries. What Lucy had done with these trail diaries, because they're, you know, I think she probably suspected that they were going to be an important piece of ephemera for American history. Um, Lucy retyped them all. They had been written in hand on little, uh, line notebooks that Emma carried on the trail, but Lucy retyped them all to make them more legible and um, more accessible to people who might be interested in Emma's experiences. Uh, and she told me that, you know, it was not uncommon for Emma to keep this journal, but uh, I don't know what has become of the journals that she kept before she started hiking the AT. I know those journals are intact and kept with Lucy and another granddaughter, but um, uh, anyhow, they provide little snapshots into certain times in her life. And then, uh, what else I thought was super useful in terms of getting to know Emma was um, a lot of the correspondence that Lucy had kept as well. So there was letters back and forth from Emma to her children, uh, from other people to Emma, and Lucy had kept all these together. Um, one of the other beautiful things for a guy like me who you know wants to write a story like this, um, Emma had kept scrapbooks. So every time a newspaper along the AT or elsewhere had written a story about her, she'd gotten a copy of the story and then she'd made uh, small corrections in the margins, which I don't know if you know this, but once in a while the newspapers might get a detail or two wrong. Um, anyhow, Emma would correct those and it's fantastic. So the story might say something like, you know, her pack weighed 32 pounds and Emma would correct it and say, my pack actually weighed 24 pounds, for instance. 
Um, they would say she wore size seven shoes and she would correct that or what have you. And this is just good because like fact checking, uh, you know, from the source who died five years before I was born. Um, it, it was really helpful in terms of get, you know, trying to get things as right as possible. Fabulous. Fabulous. Okay. So let's actually get on to the story of the first crossing before we get on to all the various other things that, uh, that she, uh, achieved. Um, so you hadn't really changed very much. I mean, the listing that I've, I've approximately got is, uh, is the one that's well recorded, really. Uh, the, the small bag, uh, a man's jacket, uh, a blanket, wearing kids' sneakers. I mean, basically, it was all homemade stuff because that was the type of uh, experience that people had. That was what was available. There wasn't a case of the whole high-tech, let's-go lightweight technical fabrics that we have today. And, and I certainly I'd like to touch on that a bit later on as well and see what Emma might have thought of that. But she just basically what needs must, and by the sound of it, she was that sort of character that lived that life in a rural existence where she would make do and make do and mend. Um, uh, she she took a uh, what is it a, a a gingham dress, which my wife reliably informs me is the perfect thing to do because it doesn't crease. So therefore, when she changed out of her men's dungarees into something respectable for town, uh, she would uh, she would fit in. But she set off, and she didn't set off to do anything apart from achieve it for her own benefits and we'll come on to the bit about the uh, the celebrity status and when that started to happen but uh, how was it her first her first walk her first uh, few weeks what i have got here is a few slides of um historical uh pictures taken on appalachian area so i'll run through those as you're talking yeah so maybe for a little bit of context it's important to understand that when uh when um, folks came uh, across the pond to the New World. <laughs> a lot of them couldn't get, couldn't, didn't have access to the Western United States, primarily because the Appalachian Mountains separate the East Coast from Greater America. And so a lot of folks wound up kind of getting hemmed in. They ran out of money, they ran out of luck, they ran out of whatever. And they started forming little mountain communities through Appalachia. And some of these communities still exist today much in the same way that they did uh, in the early 20th century. Um, these slides illustrate as much. Um, it was a hard scrabble life. Uh, you know, they staked out little mountainous claims and tried to make farms, uh, you know, in, in the, in the, in the, in the hills. Um, and I think because of the, uh, geology of the area, these people became super self-reliant there, you know, travel wasn't easy getting, getting around was, um, super difficult. And so they became self-reliant. They did for themselves. They raised their own food. They, uh, lived by a creed that if the birds don't go, go hungry, then we shouldn't either. Um, that there's plenty of abundance of food and, and whatnot in in nature. So they made their own furniture. They made their own uh, made their own homes. Um, these were a reliant, resilient people, and it's the same stock that she you know that she came out of. Uh, so when she set off in 1955, you know it was a time when um, uh, even though the roads building program in the U.S. was going great guns, it was a time in which a lot of people in Appalachia never had any contact with the outside world. And so visitors were rare. Certainly somebody just kind of walking up to the farm would have been very rare. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it didn't happen. They were, they were disconnected uh, by the mountains uh, to, to the rest of the world. And so I think probably as a result of this, um, they were a little uh, uh, distrusting of visitors. Uh, Emma ran, ran into some interesting experiences right at first. And we're talking about as she left Georgia and came into uh, North Carolina, um, she ran into people who were suspicious of her, who didn't believe that she was walking from Georgia to Maine, because why would anyone do that? You know, um, and of course, these were hard scrabble farm people. Uh, so she sometimes had to prove who she was. And in one instance, she walks up to a farm and there's a farmer sitting on the porch, as I recall, uh, drinking a glass of tea. His wife is out in the field working and Emma introduces herself, says she's walking from Georgia to Maine. And the guy says, oh, yeah, we'll prove it. And so she's got to go into her bag to get out some identification to prove she is who she says she is. But this guy 
thinks that she is an agent of the federal government in Washington, D.C., come to, I don't know, mess up his life or something like that. Um, so, so the folks, a lot of the folks that she met early on were super distrusting. By the way, this is also a time in history in which uh, there was sort of feuds going on, not just between families in Appalachia, but also between people who were making illegal moonshine, which is, uh, you know, mash whiskey, um, who were making illegal moonshine and, uh, and revenuers, the, the IRS, the federal agents who were trying to impose taxes on that illegal moonshine or trying to regulate the sale of that illegal moonshine. And so uh, some wars, uh, you know, small skirmishes going on from time to time in Appalachia between moonshiners and revenuers. So this is the world through which she was, she was walking uh, in that era. Um, you know, and uh, one other thing that, that she pointed out that I thought probably is, is true today, she said the smaller, I'm sorry, the larger the house, the, the uh, less likely the homeowner would be to let her stay the night. So she found the folks who lived in the little houses far more welcoming to a stranger than the folks who were a little more well off, um, you know, who, who were perhaps more suspicious or less likely to let her, you know, let her in, uh, to let her stay in the barn, to let her sleep on the porch or whatnot. The We've certainly found it ourselves, and I've said it in previous podcasts, you know, we found that the, the people with the least give the most, um, and it sure. always seems to be the same wherever you go in the world. Um, now, a lot of people, there was, there was a bit of conversation that's been going on online before the, this, uh, obviously, the, we started this interview, and I've been, when I was promoting it last week, and a few people were sort of querying the fact, how did she manage to survive as regards uh, calories and calorific way, uh, would she have enough? Would she be able to carry enough food and survive that way? And uh, there was a discussion going on that she wouldn't be able to live off berries. But I think it's a combination of things, isn't it? From what I read in the book, she was uh, obviously adept at um, collecting berries and knew what wild fruits and and things were available to her. She wasn't averse to eating roadkill, and uh, she would often have a fire. Uh, well, yeah, I think most of the time from the way I read it, she, she would have a fire if possible. But she didn't use the fire for cooking, unless it was cooking the roadkill. She was using that for warmth and for drying her clothes out. But on a, on a regular basis, I know during the early parts of the 20s, 30s, during the Depression period, she was known locally for welcoming people that were looking for work, at least giving them a meal or something to drink or whatever. So she had no aversion in going up to these properties and knocking on the door. And as you say, being a stranger, but actually asking for some food. Um, was it the norm in those days or, or was it uh, very, very unusual? And, uh, you know, I suppose. In historically, it is the start of trail magic as it's known today. I was just going to ask you that, Bob. Do you, do you all uh, are familiar with trail magic? You know yeah, what yeah, this sure. is? Yeah, so, yeah. All right. Yeah. So, well, she made her own trail magic. That's how I look at it. Um, and by, by the way, I'm right in the middle of packing for a four-day trip on the Florida Trail in North Florida. And I have brought along my uh, – it's behind me. I won't mess with that. I brought along my jet boil. Uh, which, you know, uses the, um, the gas mix, uh, yeah, it's a yeah, compact yeah. little stove and you get water boiling in 45 seconds if you want. Uh, yeah. and then we dump that into our backpacker pantry meals or whatever, and it rehydrates and it's delicious, it's like a, a really good meal in about five minutes. She had none of this, uh, right? So she ate berries, she ate nuts, she ate something that she called sorrel salad, which sorrel is a plant that grows in, you know, in the Appalachian mountains. Yeah, yeah. It is not, a, it's not good. It tastes like grass. I've eaten it before. Uh, it's like a tart, bitter um, sort of plant. But she made a regular, you know, she was eating this on a regular basis, especially when she was walking through the very rural stretches of the Appalachian Trail. Fortunately, the AT runs by quite a few towns and you're never more than, you know, four or five days hike from uh uh you know from a town or or at least from a road where you can you know catch a ride into a town and so she made a habit of um like you said of you know introducing herself to strangers to walking up to homes that she would you know she'd see a light burning in the distance and think i'm gonna go try there and she'd knock on the door somebody would answer she would introduce herself um 
you know, more often than not, people invited her in. If they didn't do that, then they would sometimes give her some extra food, send her off the next day with a, at least a meal to eat. But by and large, she made her own trail magic the entire route. I think she had about $200. By my calculation, she brought with her about $200 in folding money for that trip. And, um, uh, you know, and that's not a lot of money. If you want to do the AT today, it'd be a piece of cake to spend about 10 grand. Um, so, uh, so think about spending $200, you know, over 145 days walk. Um, I but think you worked it out as 10 cents a mile. That's right. Yeah. People took care of her. And it's interesting you mentioned about the calories because when I finished this manuscript, I sent it to a, I had not spent a whole lot of time on the AT myself by that point, but I sent it to a friend who had through hiked and this guy's an author. Uh, uh, he is a, he's a dear friend. I said, read this and tell me what you think. And his response was, Ben, are you sure she did this? And, um, for her to have lied about it would have taken, you know, a lot of journal entries that name specific places and specific things and specific people that never happened. Right. When in fact she had met lots of people on the trail, uh, um, that I was able to verify. She had accounted for every single day, every sing the mileage of every single day in her journals. Um, this was not a person who was interested in making this up. She wanted to, she wanted to take a hike and this is what she was going to do. But, but, uh, but my, my friend said, you know, he was consumed, he was, he was burning about 4,000 calories a day on the trail and still having a hard time maintaining weight. So he said, how is a 67 year old woman able to do this? Just eating sorrel salad on some days, just eating, you know, wild strawberries that she found trailside some days. And the fact is she lost 30 pounds during this hike, uh, sort of a big deal, but, um, you know, it's, she, she, she made it, uh, <laughs> I think I think it came down to relying on the goodwill of the people who lived along the trail to keep her fed occasionally. And that first hike was one thing. That was a big deal. In the intervening year, you know, everybody that she had met on the trail, she took their name and their location. And so in the year between her first and second hike, well, she corresponded with them, telling them, hey, I'll be back next year. So make sure you look for me. And when she came back around, sure enough, these were friends of hers by this point. And so they would send her off often with sandwiches, with things to eat for the next day. She enjoyed visiting with, the, you know, with the folks. And so uh, that's how she, that's how she made it. So. To put it into a simple question, then, uh, I suppose I'm just trying to grasp really for myself and anybody else watching, was it expected? Did she, did she knock on the door and expect to have uh, received something quite happily with no guilt as regards, let me do something for you or let me give you a few cents for it or whatever it may be? Or was that just the 1950s and the attitude of mountain people in those days? Well, um... I mean, it was partly the attitude of mountain people, I think. When, once you got past the suspicion and once they were comfortable with who you are, these are the best hearted people in the world. Um, uh, you'll find that even today in, in you know, the region that we call Appalachia. But um, she was not a stranger to anybody. And I think you have a photo of her with some boys. There's a great uh, story, if, if you can put your fingers on that. Uh, she was nearing Orford, New Hampshire. Um, and walked up to the door of a home and I spoke with uh, one of the gentlemen who's in the photograph with her. This was in 1955. And the way he recalls, he would have been eight or nine years old at the time. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, so um, the way he recalls, uh, there was a knock at the, he and his mother was preparing dinner uh, one evening. There's a knock at the door. They weren't expecting company, but his mother went and answered the door and there stood uh, Emma Gatewood looking about like that, wearing a green eye shade and a bag slung over her shoulder, probably smelling the high heaven. Um, and in his memory, uh, he, re he, he recalls her just kind of walking in, brushing right past his mother. And, and as she did, she said, I'm Grandma Gatewood. What's for dinner? And she sat herself <laughs> down at the family dinner table. And uh, just pretended like it was, you know, a regular afternoon. And of course, his mother fed her dinner. She told stories to the kids while they were uh, while they were eating. 
And she uh, very quickly became, you know, sort of one of the family until she left later that day. Um, they were glad to have her as a visitor. And every year after, when she came back through, they looked, they knew to look for her and they treated her, they treated her well. So that's pretty much it. She just, she wasn't a stranger. She was not afraid to, you know, ask for something that she needed and she, she needed help. She, you know, could not have survived. She could not have done what she did just on, uh, you know, the nuts and berries and sorrel salad to be found along the Appalachian Trail. She needed um, sustenance once in a while and, and uh, was not afraid to ask for it. She's also also very appreciative and very thankful. And like I said, she made friends with these people. It wasn't just a matter of them feeding her and sending her uh, on her way. She would correspond and, you know, in later years, and many of them she corresponded with for the rest of her life. So let's uh, talk about a couple of incidences on the on the trail itself then to bring it alive and then to go on to some of the other historical things that were taking place at the time, um, which obviously refers to the, to the hurricanes. Uh, there's a couple of nice stories the, um, of her crossing a river and, and sleeping with some, uh, some guys, some boys from Harlem. But I, I just want to pre pre preempt that if I could. Um, there's something else you mentioned in your book, and I've gathered a few of the notes together, but I just wanted to emphasize again, just to, to comment on her character. She was a very straight-laced sort of woman. She was a proper woman. Was, I think you, the word you used in a sentence in your book was, she was a white gloves sort of woman. And uh, right. I, I've known eld elderly relatives that are like that. There's a right way of doing things, and there's a right way to behave, and there's a, a correct way that boys and girls should meet and, and whatever. And, and in fact, I'm jumping ahead now, but towards the end of the book, I think there was when she was in her 70s, uh, some uh, a gentleman offered to go walking with her for a few days and she didn't she didn't accept him because it wasn't going to be proper <laughs> in right. her 70s. I thought it was epic. But anyway, I just want to come back to this particular story because uh, you, uh, you tell it really well from uh, from the how she came across this this uh, this hut full of boys from Harlem. Yeah, well, um you know, as if walking 2,000 miles through through the uh, Appalachian wilderness wasn't difficult enough, uh, there were two weather events that really impacted uh, that region in 1955, in the summer of 55. And I think it was starting in early July. Oh, yeah, we're in August, I guess. So Hurricanes Connie and Diane both blew in back to back and kind of took they weren't the same path, but kind of took relatively, they both made landfall in relatively the same place in the U.S. And, uh, and both wreaked havoc on, um, on the mid-Appalachian region and also on uh, New York and New England, causing, um, well, at the time, they were the most expensive storms on record in American history. They killed somewhere in the neighborhood of 211 people in New England. Um, uh, you know, caused uh, great, great amounts of uh, damage. And she was exposed for much of this on the Appalachian Trail. Uh, so she had a lot of uh, um, uh, difficulty, both slogging through the water every day, slogging through the wind and rain, occasionally fearing that she would get blown off a mountainside. And if you've never lived through a hurricane, they're, they're you know, pretty common to me since I've lived in Florida since 2005, you know, often uh, cat one, cat two hurricanes can bring gusts of wind that can actually blow you down, blow you off your feet. And so if you can imagine being exposed in the outdoor, not just, um, you know, afraid of uh, widow killers, as we call them, or widow makers, rather the trees, dead wood trees falling down on you and things like that, just actually being scared of getting blown off a mountain. These are the things that she had to deal with. Um, but she came, uh, she came upon in the Green Mountains of Vermont, uh, uh, after slogging through water all day one day, she came upon a shelter, a lean-to occupied by, as she described, um, eight, uh, she used the term colored boys, from uh, a Catholic parish in Harlem. By that, she means eight African-American boys, most likely from a Catholic parish in Harlem. And she just describes them kind of as Catholic kids. And she said that when she walked up to the shelter, they were uh, they were very kind. They invited her to partake of their corn pone that they cooked on the fire. She said the, the boys were a little rambunctious. They were picking apples, uh, unripe apples off the apple trees and throwing them at one another. Um, 
and and they invited her to stay that night, but it looked like the shelter was a little full, it was a little tight for her to sleep there. She decided to try to go on, but after a couple of hours of hiking, she realized that she couldn't make it further up the trail. They were uh, there was a, she came to a stream that had escaped its bounds. It was at flood stage and she couldn't cross safely on her own. She, she returned to that shelter and decided to spend the night with those boys. She wrote that she had a nice time. She, you know, ha had a, um, slightly difficult time falling asleep because the young man next to her, she was curled up in a corner, but the young man next to her, he would throw his arm over her shoulder, uh, in his own sleep and she would move it back. And he would throw it back over again, and she would move it back. And if you can imagine this, a 67-year-old woman with uh, eight um, African-American teens and, uh, and their two white leaders trying to all sleep in the same three-sided shelter. It's just sort of a funny picture, especially when you think about 1954 was uh, the Supreme Court decision that decided Brown versus Board of Education, a famous Supreme Court decision uh, in the U.S. that um, decided sc public schooling should be equal for all races, essentially. And what this did was created some uh, outbursts of racial violence. Oh, yeah. In a picture, that image of Emma sleeping sleeping in this shelter with these boys um, is just kind of beautiful to me. Well, it turns out she wouldn't learn this until later. Maybe actually she, I don't think ever kn knew, but I pieced this together. It turns out the boys staying in that shelter that day had all come from Harlem and they weren't exactly Catholic boys. The summer of 1955 in Harlem, which is a neighborhood in, in, in uh, New York, New York City, um, it was an especially violent summer. It was hot. There was gang warfare over every square inch of concrete in Harlem. And the violence, the bloodshed got so bad that the Catholic Church saw the need to appoint these two young seminarians to identify the forehead honchos of these two rival and warring gangs and offer them an all expense paid trip to the Green Mountains of Vermont in order to um, broker the peace. And so these Catholic boys that Emma Gatewood slept with that night were, in fact, the gang leaders from these two rival gangs in Harlem who were up there trying to uh, <laughs> figure things out for themselves. Um, and uh, as we, as I would later find out, she she uh, really came to like these boys and, in fact, rode on the back of one of the young strapping teenagers across that flood stage creek the next morning when they all hiked out together. Um, so this was a unique experience for her and also an interesting experience. I like, again, I don't think she ever knew who exactly she was staying with. I found that nugget, make a long story short, it was accounted for in a chapter of a book that was written by one of those Catholic priests who had taken the boys out that, that summer uh, and remembered meeting Grandma Gatewood on the trail. But, uh, yeah, and I'm sure that makes a fascinating read as well. But again, you you, you portray it beautifully in the uh, in the book with the detail. And as you rightly say, Hurricane Connie and Diane really did raise the the water levels. There was a, another couple of characters as well. That was the um, the U.S. naval um, naval guys, Howard Bell and Steve Sargent. Now, again, yeah. just to remind people where it, where it was, as I understand it, uh, Emma didn't see the sea or saw the sea for the first time in 1926, and she could she never went in to swim. She she couldn't swim, so right. the hurricanes had raised these creeks some 30 feet or or whatever in a very very short period of time. And there's a horrific story which is must go down in American history of one of the campsites where the water raised so quickly that uh, the children got into the, the camp house and went up each level so that eventually they went into the attic and the house collapsed, unfortunately killing a lot of people. Um, right. So it was, it was pretty treacherous times, really, and, and obviously the, the, the trail itself is nothing like or was nothing like the trail is, as, is, as it's seen today. Uh, so she, well, she did a lot, of, uh, a lot of bashing to get through it. But uh, do tell the story about the two naval guys and, and their impressions of her. Yeah, she had stayed uh, the night before at the same shelter these two boys were staying, and they were both 18, 19 years old, on leave from uh, the Navy, and they were just out for, you know, a week of backpacking, hiking, fishing, that sort of thing. They weren't trying to do the whole trail, 
But uh, Emma had slept with them one night before, and then she woke up before they did the next morning and took off on her own. And when she made it down the trail, she came to a spot called Clarendon Gorge. And the water had risen so rapidly that it, uh, so high that it had washed out the pedestrian footbridge uh, that took an AT hiker across the gorge. And so she had no safe way to cross. She walked upstream and downstream and couldn't find, um, you know, any safe passage. So she knew those boys would be coming behind her and she thought she'd sit down and wait for them. And sure enough, a couple of hours later, they show up and in all their youthful wisdom, they decide the best thing they can do is to use parachute cord to tie five foot two Emma Gatewood in between them, uh, including her pack, so like just tie themselves together so they could all uh, traverse this flood stage creek together. And this is what they did. And, uh, you know, Emma writes in her journal that she had a difficult time with this. Like, like you said, this, this was a deadly storm. Uh, it, it, there's nothing to laugh about. Uh, we, I guess we can laugh all these years later, but, um, but all tied together, these three human beings took baby step by baby step all the way across Clarendon Gorge until they made it safely to the other side. And once they did, uh, boy, Emma, um, you know, grabbed her stuff and she said, well, boys, you got grandma across. Thanks very much. And she kind of took off upstream and, uh, and left them behind. They never saw her again. And she did record their names in her journal. So I was able to track them down. Both of them are still living. One lives down here in Sarasota, Florida, not, not far from me. Uh, and I called him up out of the blue one day. I told him as I was reporting the book, I told him who I was. And I said, I think you're the same guy who met a woman named Emma Gatewood on the Appalachian Trail way back in 1955. And he said, I was, he remembered that experience. And I told him what Emma had written about it. And she kind of addressed it in a funny way. She said, you know, and then they got me across and I left. I said, hey, got grandma across and I took off. And, and I said, do you remember it like that? And he said, Ben, I, I could never forget that because I still to this day have nightmares about it. And he's now in his 80s, right? So uh, this was <laughs> made a lasting impact on uh, Mr. Sargent. Um, but uh, yeah, th this was, you know, treachery, but she wasn't about to turn back because of a flood level s stream. She, she kept right on going. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, well, we're time is marching on, and there's so much to talk about. So, are you okay for time for a, for another half hour or so? This is this is going great. We're entertaining good thirty plus people as well, which is which is really good to see. So, I hope everybody's enjoying it. Do by all means drop a note into the chat room. Rose is is uh, waiting to help you or reply or comment or whatever. And we'll come on to some questions a bit later on. But um, a couple of things I wanted to talk about now, really, and it's the start of something you alluded to earlier on was, as I understand it, she was 48 days in, 300 miles in, before she received her first newspaper uh, coverage or article or whatever it may be. I mean, she didn't do it for the celebrity status, but this thing started to grow like topsy. So what I'd like to do is talk a bit about this and how this sort of grew, and uh, then we'll come on to you actually walking in her footsteps on footsteps on the on Mount Katahdin as well on the on the last day and and comparing notes on that. But uh, tell us a bit about, about her celebrity status and how it started to slowly build. For sure, and I'm so sorry about that ding. I thought I, if y'all are hearing that, I thought I had this uh, all shut off, and somehow my computer is betraying me. So I'll just press on. Yeah. You're um, a popular guy. So, You're a popular guy. Uh, yeah. So, so um, as it turns out, uh, uh, Emma Gatewood uh, thought from the beginning that um, that she was going to that somebody if if people knew about her journal journey, what she set out to do, that somebody would try to stop her. If not, that she would be hurt or harmed by someone. And the difficulty in that. Uh, uh, is that um, without telling anybody, nobody knows where you were. And so her her family, her people, her children, and 11 of them were alive and, you know, back in Ohio and elsewhere. They didn't know where she was. And um, and there's no indication that she was ever going to tell them and she, until she finished hiking the AT. But she arrived at Roanoke, Virginia, um, which is, you know, getting close to midway. And uh, but before anybody ever talked her into uh, telling her story, before any newspaper reporter stopped her so that she might um, make public what it was she was trying to do. And boy, when they did that, then the 
the word spread like wildfire. Um, uh, every newspaper reporter in every town from that point north wanted to interview her for the story. But by then, nobody knew where she, where she was. And so much of her family back home re actually read it in, uh, in the newspaper. Um, it had run, I'm gonna try to take care of this. Uh, I'm so sorry. Um, is this bothering you guys like it's bothering me? I'm so sorry, I thought I had this taken care of. Um, but I'm somehow on a text thread that's just uh, beeping, beeping, beeping. Give me one second. Um, so, uh, so she presses on from Roanoke, and um, and 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 by then, all of America starts to tune in to her story. Um, like I said, every town that she walked through subsequent, there was a newspaper reporter, or sometimes a radio reporter, television story, a tr television reporter waiting to tell America uh, about you know this 67, 67 year old woman who was trying to through hike the Appalachian Trail. Um, um, and, uh, and it didn't wind up being dangerous for her. In fact, I think with more attention focused on what she was doing and more knowledge about who she was, it probably opened the doors to her getting more meals because people knew to expect her because they had read about her in the newspaper and things like that. So it actually was probably more beneficial for her. And then on down the line, you know, this started to grow from not just the small town newspapers, but uh, but to uh, major newspapers and major publications. Eventually, um, at Mount Katahdin, she is intercepted by a reporter from a, a, what was at the time a fledgling magazine called Sports Illustrated. And this reporter, Mary Snow, convinced Emma Gatewood to let her story uh, go on a rant. And um, this became one of the biggest her new brand to the uh, Appalachian Trail. The newspaper also comes the club into her. She wasn't about to do it at first, and they said, "Well, let us give you a place to stay at the Trail Club uh, shelter." And they offered to carry her bag an additional ten miles or so and meet her further up the trail. And by the time she arrived, her defenses were worn down a little bit, and they uh, uh, eventually got her to um, late one night got her to uh, share who she was and what it was she was doing. And that became the impetus for all of this uh, coverage that, that that was to follow, that included not just the, for the rest of that first hike, but also many, many stories in newspapers on her second hike and her third hike, and then the hike um, sort of the other direction on the Oregon Trail. Okay, well, I just want to pause for a second because uh, technology is telling me that the, the stream might be having a bit of a hiccup at the moment. But this recording is going to continue in the same quality that we've got so far. So uh, if the stream goes down, don't worry, I'll re-release the video a bit later on once it's uh, been compiled and put it on YouTube in high quality. But I'm hoping the stream will, will um, pick itself back up again. Um, and uh, if uh, if it continues, are we still getting problems with the sound, Rose? Yeah, I think it's it's picked up again. So it's picked up again, is it? Okay. Well, if it if it uh, breaks, we'll we'll stop and start the stream again. But we'll continue the story. Where everything's going really well. Thank you, Ben, for for being patient with us. Um, so that that's uh, that's obviously how it how it started. And and as you say, every every small town news newspaper reporter would know the next one in the next town, of course. Uh, and she started to get sort of uh, well national recognition, I, I guess. Or, but she wasn't really aware of this at all, apart from she saw the reporters. But I don't think she was aware of just how big it was becoming at that stage. And again, she wasn't doing it for the celebrity status, as as many people from Instagram will be doing it these days. Um, but let's just go on to on to Mount Katahdin and that uh, that final uh, day up there. I understand that uh, that you, in wanting to be true to the book. Uh, actually uh, hired a guide who tracked down her original route because, as we said, the, the routes have changed over the years for different reasons. Yeah. And you took uh, your expensive equipment, which you probably spent a small fortune on, getting yourself ready for it, uh, and got yourself onto Katahdin and started to to climb and, and follow the route. So I just really wanted to know, you you no doubt read the, the, her, her, um, her diary, her, her journal, of that particular day very very closely in great detail and then you walked in her footsteps albeit yeah. with modern equipment how did you feel at that moment did you really feel that you were connecting in in some special way with her 
That was my effort. You know, uh, I, I think the, the last day for her, at least in terms of the importance of the whole trip, the last day for her was just as important as every other day before that. And so she addressed it in her journal the same way. And, 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 and this was not a person who, who waxed poetically about what she was experiencing on the trail. She wrote very matter of factly, here's, here's where I started. Here's where I woke up. This is what I ate. This is where I walked. Here's how tired I was. You know, it was that sort of uh, um, surface level technical detail. So she didn't she didn't think of any grand terms about what her hike might have meant, about what that last day climbing Mount Katahdin and becoming the first woman to solo through the AT would have meant. Um, it was just another day for her, just another walk. And so uh, I realized as the climax of the book, I needed to kind of um, – make it bigger uh, uh, than than um, the small set of facts that I was working with, right? So I tried to bring myself into it a little bit and tell modern readers what that experience might look like for them. Uh, I'm a healthy guy who goes on lots of hikes, and I wanted to describe accurately what that climb up, how difficult that climb up Mount Katahdin would have been for me in good weather conditions so that you could imagine what it might have been for her, you know, hiking through the sleet with a busted knee, one lens broken out of her glasses and, and you know, the, the other one fogging up over and over um, uh, through the freezing cold. Um, and so... Uh, so, you know, ho hopefully that hopefully that worked to to help people understand that this is not an easy hike. This is a challenging climb at the very end of the mountains. One of the first places the sun kisses uh, the eastern s side of the United States every morning. Uh, one of the tallest mountains in Maine at, at just about a mile high. Um, it is a uh, beyond that a, a an amazing mountain and one of the most sacred and beautiful places, I think, in all of America. Um you know, H.D. Thoreau uh, climbed Mount Katahdin, I think, in, in the 1850s and nearly came undone on his climb. He said, mm -hmm. basically, this is uh, this is um, no man's land. This is a place where man doesn't have the right to be. We should uh, mm -hmm. preserve and protect this. Um, and he, he said he wrote that he felt like God was trying to dislodge him from the mountain the whole time he was climbing up it. And so. Um, so it's an important spot. And for me to do that, to walk in her footsteps, uh, you, you pointed out earlier, uh, a lot of the trail is different today. Someone told me 99% of the trail is actually different today than it was in 1955. And so the only stretch that we knew for sure that was going to be exactly the same uh, was, was the Hunt Spur up Mount Katahdin. And we used her diaries, uh, gave, gave them to the, a guy who was the Baxter uh, State Park's um, superintendent of trails. He used that knowledge and his knowledge of the past uh, uh, in Baxter State Park to bring us up the exact same route she would have walked. And I was just trying to get into her head, you know, um, and what a what a neat experience that was to spend so long studying the life of this impressive, awesome woman who I came to love. Uh, and then to step in her footsteps, to follow her footsteps up this historic trail to the top of Mount Katahdin to see what she saw became uh, a beautiful thing. And as you know, you know, when she got up there, it wasn't it was a bit of ceremony, but she was ready to get back down pretty quickly. So she signed the register at the top of Mount Katahdin. She sang the first verse of America, the Beautiful. And she said, I've done it. I said I'd do it and I've done it. And without much uh, uh, pomp or circumstance, she just kind of turned around and walked back down. And then, of course, at the base, she was greeted by all the reporters who were waiting for her to see if she had completed her journey. And it was a moment of celebration. I understand she was also a victim of fake news as well. She was probably one of the earliest people to have recorded fake news because CBS News had picked up a, an incorrect report from one of the small town reporters saying that she was going to do a square dance on the top and they asked her if she did that or not. Um, so I, I found that quite amusing. But when you went up there yourself and you obviously, there was quite a few people up there, um, you obviously got into conversation with them and, and no doubt as part of the research and part of conversation, you mentioned the name. Uh, what was the feeling that it gave you when they started to reply back to you how much they could relate to, to, to Grandma Gatewood and how much they knew about her? 
I was blown away because uh, I, I knew that she enjoyed a certain legacy among people who hiked the Appalachian Trail and those who just love the Appalachian Trail. But I didn't know how widespread it was. And I didn't I certainly didn't know that just about everybody standing on top of that mountain would have recognized her name. Uh, a lot of these folks, by the way, we, we, we did this in uh, September, I think September 25th, 25th or 26th of 2012. Um, uh, and, and she had finished on the, I think the 25th or 26th, forgive my memory for failing on this part, but, um, but we did, you know, we climbed it the same day years and years later. Uh, anyways, I wanted, we finished the same time that there were a number of through hikers who were finishing and I didn't want to impact, I, I, I didn't want to mess up the, the sheer joy one gets from fulfilling that mission, from completing that incredible hike that takes, you know, several months. Um, and so I let them have their moment of celebration. I let them take their photos and I kind of sheepishly approached them afterwards. And I would just ask, Hey, do you know about grandma Gatewood? I'm writing a book about her. Do you have any thoughts or whatever? And to, to a T everybody, you know, everybody knew who she was, but everyone had seemed like everyone had different ideas about what she had done. Um, and you know, I talked to one uh, young man I remember who said, you know, you got to respect anybody who can hike the entire Appalachian Trail barefoot. And it made me think, well, her her legacy has grown a little bit. You know, she wore Keds, but she was never barefoot so far as I know. Um, but that's, that's, you know, so be it. That's how her, her story has grown. Uh, but it was cool. It was, you know, to learn for, not just from those folks in that experience, but also uh, in, in, in the years since, uh, how big of an impact this woman has had both on people personally and also on the success and survival of the Appalachian trail, um, is a pretty cool thing. I don't know of another person who's, um, kind of done more organically, not because she meant to, but organically who's done more to, um, promote the trail, uh, and also to criticize the trail when it needed it so that folks, uh, uh, you, know, you know, it led to better maintenance and, and um, um, better ecological sensitivity and a better experience for hikers and things like that. So it was cool to kind of step back and get this big, bigger picture of who she was and what she meant to this thing that's so beloved and so important to uh, people around the world. And in fact, nice. that time I climbed Mount, Mount Katahdin, I saw we had somebody from New Zealand in here. I finished, we were coming down with a woman who uh, appeared to me to be in her 60s and 70s, and she was wearing Tiva sandals, and I think she had left her bag at the bottom, and so she was hiking without a backpack, really moving, blowing right past us as we came down the mountain. And I caught up to her and I, I had a started a conversation and she was from New Zealand and she right. said this was her, she was completing her third through hike of the Appalachian Trail. Oh, yeah. And she did so without any ceremony. She had just finished that day and she was on her way back down and here comes, you know, a stranger. Hey, what are you doing out here? And she was like, yeah, I just finished my third through hike of the Appalachian Trail. And I said, are you going to do it again? She was like, yeah, I'm getting kind of bored with this one. I might go try to do another <laughs> one. But 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 that's yeah. the case anymore. You go on the AT and you meet people from all over the world who have decided yeah. uh, that, that they want to do a through hike and, you know, have set out to do it. It's a very cool thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, again, time's marching on. There's still plenty to talk about if you're OK for time. Um, one sure. uh, one person has asked um, why, wondering why she carried her stuff in the bag rather than the backpack like Earl Schaefer did. Um, in the photo, uh, and I've got a picture of, of I think, of some of her equipment here, uh, which I think yeah. is in the um, in the uh, in the in the um, I'll get the word out in a second. The, the ATC. Um, uh, so perhaps you could quickly just run through what she did take, and she took it on subsequent hikes as well. Um, and before we get into the next stage of of the legacy, really. Yeah. She so she brought along. I mean, what we know. And by the way, she never. The, the part of what's so interesting to me is I'm always making adjustments in my gear. Right? If your backpack doesn't fit or is like slightly uncomfortable, well, you oh yeah, might save up and get another backpack or um, yeah. adjust the straps or what have you. Uh, if, if you're bringing the wrong kind of food, which I did 
I t- took my kids two summers ago uh, to do a 260 mile stretch on the AT, and I just brought food that they didn't want to eat. I, uh, you know, I was trying to save some money, and I dehydrated a lot of stuff myself. And it turns out it didn't taste nearly as good as the backpacker, you know, the store bought backpack meals. Anyways, she never changed her gear. She basically brought the same exact stuff for all three through hikes, and uh, by and large for for most of the hike on the uh, Oregon Trail. And it included this denim drawstring sack that was, you know, fairly sizable, would hold some gear. Um, uh, she brought along. That tin that you see there uh, pictured, it was a Band-Aid tin, and it had in it um, some uh, uh, meager supplies. Uh, you know, she brought some Vic salve. She brought uh, a couple of Band-Aids, some bobby pins to keep her hair out of her face. Um, uh, she wore canvas sneakers most of the time, uh, Keds, sometimes Chuck Taylors, uh, Converse, um, regular athletic socks, men's dungarees. Like you mentioned, the the, the gingham uh, dress, which she could shake out in the event she had to walk through a town or something. Um, she brought no tent, no sleeping bag. Um, she brought a shower curtain to keep the rain off. So, you know, if you can imagine uh, hiking through two back-to-back hurricanes with a shower curtain, that's your only protection from the rain. Um, and, and she didn't adjust, you know, that it wasn't like, in 1957, she decided, oh, I'll bring a tent this time. She just brought the same, the same gear. Um, so it, it's a curious selection of, of stuff, but it was very light. And it ranged anywhere from about, I think at its lightest, her pack may, maybe weighed about 15 pounds. And at its heaviest, it may, maybe weighed about 30 pounds. So she, you know, very, very much fit the, uh, the ID of um, a lightweight, pioneer, even though we weren't even talking about lightweight hiking, we were calling it ultralight hiking. Certainly at that time, she just brought what she needed. And then if she didn't have something, she, you know, either did without or found a way to uh, get around it to ad lib. One time she found a fork uh, at a campfire that somebody had discarded and she was like, Oh, this will make a fine comb. And she used the fork to comb out her hair. And actually that makes sense. If I had hair, I'd probably comb it with the fork yeah 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 well you and i use both use polish obviously that's uh, that's the only way to go um the the a couple of things that did strike me when i did look through the the details was that she obviously lit, lit a fire on a regular basis uh, either to dry her clothes out um she lit a fire to heat rocks and she slept on warm rocks um i know that uh, the sack she emptied a sack out a few times and filled it full of leaves and she used that as a mattress to sleep on and then she slept in all the huts and all the various places that she could find earlier on uh, or find as she went along rather but the 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 one thing that uh, occurred to me it is did she take any fire lighting equipment because obviously the matches wouldn't have lasted very long in the weather that she was going through so were you aware of of her having any technique for for lighting a fire She'd obviously be very good at it anyway, but I mean, I just wondered if there was anything that came to mind. Yeah, no, I don't. I, I, I have no idea. Um, you know, it, everything that I know about her gear, uh, you know, she, she um, I did, never mentioned any fire starting devices, but you're right. She did a lot of times. Uh, I, it seems like I recall her saying her matches were wet a few times. So maybe she was just resupplying with the matches occasionally and carrying them in that little a uh, tin full of band-aids um but it's a fine question i'm not uh i'm not 100 percent sure on that it may be well, lost to history unfortunately it's one of those things these days everybody goes on about different ways to light fires and i was just just curious as what? she's one of the original old timers what what she used but anyway we, we've kept people's attention so far and we're going to go on to now the effect and the legacy that she left but we'll we'll start by looking at her celebrity status as it started to build and uh, obviously she was getting a lot of uh, press coverage and she did it a second time two years later, I think it was. Uh, and then she went on to do the, the Oregon Trail and the celebrity status just went through the roof. And, and perhaps you'd just like to eloquently describe how she arrived in Portland and really what her status consisted of by the time she got to that stage. And well, as you're doing so, I'll just flip through some of the press things here. Sure. Yeah. So as I mentioned, starting in Roanoke, Virginia, uh, with that first newspaper story, story, the word, the word just spread immensely. 
Uh, one of the photos that you've got on the screen now is from um, is the one on the uh, on my right is the uh, a story from Sports Illustrated magazine. Um, it, you know, it became it became the case where, uh, like I said, where people would read about her in the newspaper and then go out looking for her. Certainly, as she hiked the Oregon Trail, which also runs about uh, two thousand miles from Independence, Missouri, to Portland, Oregon. Uh, she was doing a lot of walking on the shoulder of the highway. And so word had spread that she was hiking the Oregon Trail and people would go out and search for her, or be driving down the highway and having read about her in the newspaper, they'd pull over and stop and they'd want to take photos of her or uh, get an autograph or things, things like that. But by the time she arrived in Portland, and this was in the year 1959, uh, there were somewhere in the neighborhood of 5,000 people waiting for her to celebrate her arrival in town, having walked the entire Oregon Trail in about 90 days. Um, so she made it into Oregon. She was treated like a celebrity. The mayor uh, uh, greeted her upon, uh, you know, her, her uh, reaching the city center. They took her up in a helicopter. They took her out on a yacht off the co off the west coast of, of the U.S. Um, they put her up at the Benson uh, Hotel, which is a very nice hotel in, in the day uh, and even today. Um, somebody told me not long ago that they even kept some of her gear, including the umbrella that she's photographed with there at the Portland Museum of History, which I tried to figure out if that's true or not. And I couldn't find anybody who could say whether they had any of that stuff, but they certainly, uh, celebrated her arrival. And, and from then on, you know, she enjoyed a level of celebrity that she'd not ever experienced probably never expected to experience before that. She made it onto uh, a television program that is now, you know, it'd be equal to like Good Morning America. Um, this was the Dave Garraway show, or the Today Show with Dave Garraway. Uh, she she got on the uh, you, a show called You Bet Your Life with Groucho Marx, which was filmed uh, out west in Hollywood. Um, uh, people were... Um, you know, they loved her. She became a sort of a, a mascot, if you will, for, uh, uh, you know, for <laughs> elderly hikers. And and she never drove a car. She never even had a driver's license. And so anytime she wanted to go somewhere, even up in years like these photos, she would just strap on her shoes and take a walk. And that sometimes meant walking to visit her daughter in Pennsylvania. She would walk from her hometown in Ohio up to Pennsylvania, 280 miles to visit uh, to visit Ken. Um, she once walked to uh, a, a national meeting of the um, uh, nat, uh, was it the National Hikers and Campers Association, Campers and Hikers Association. Uh, it was nothing for her to just set out on foot. And, and she, starting at the age of 67, by my calculation, she uh, accumulated about 14,000 miles on foot between 1955 when she started the AT and 1973 when she finally died it was an incre incredible accomplishment yeah yeah absolutely absolutely um well, well we'll start to wind up a bit now i think the the final thing i wanted to uh, just show people was the um memorial the the historical marker uh, that's that's to her there and i understand that she had a uh, uh, there is a trail the grandma greatwood memorial trail which is a bit like a rock concert from your description i believe of, of the yeah, popularity sure of thousands of people uh, arriving to do a particular six and a half mile walk on a, on a certain day. Is that correct? That's correct. It's a very popular trail and that hike, which happens every January called the winter hike, which she led for years and years, remains a very popular hike. I went a few years ago and the, and the, the official count was somewhere in the neighborhood of 5,000 people had shown up on this one Saturday to take a hike. Um, and, and forgive me for not talking more about her legacy before, but, uh, yeah, just since the book has come out, they've erected that historical marker in her hometown of Cheshire, Ohio. Um, the New York times, which is a venerable newspaper here, here in the U S the paper of record for us, uh, saw fit to do a news obituary, uh, about a year ago, a year and a half ago, uh, as a part of a series they're doing called overlooked, but they didn't give proper news obituaries to uh women and others who had wow. done who had made significant contributions to american society okay. and so years after her death she finally got an obit in the new york times which was 
a pretty cool thing. And, and her family, uh, was certainly happy to see that. Um, but her, her, her legacy also lives in, you know, in a million other ways. She's, she was a member of the second class of, uh, entrance into the Appalachian hall of fame. Uh, um, yeah, the second class of Appalachian hikers hall of fame. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, anywhere you go on the AT today, Grandma Gatewood and her story are never uh, uh, far away. Um, I can, you know, spend a day on the trail and bump into two or three people that want to talk about Grandma Gatewood. It's just a, you know, it's just a good story that everybody can celebrate and everybody likes. She she was a, a character with few blemishes, I think, and she did so much for the trail and so much to preserve the history of the trail and also to um, encourage people who are in their golden years to get out of doors and that it's not, uh, it's not, you know, too much if you're 67 or 77 or 87, it's, it's rarely too much to, you know, take a 2000 mile walk if you have what it takes in terms of ambition and heart. Um, and that's what she left us all, the, this idea that, you know, it's more, uh, it's more heart than head. Uh, you just put one foot in front of the other about 5 million times and you too can, can walk 2000 miles through the wilderness. I think uh, I think one of the quotes in a, in, a, in the in your book she said something about um a, a 2000 mile trail after the life I've lived lived a 2000 mile trail is nothing so uh, I thought full respect to her park. really a great character so anyway folks I'm going to uh, just let you know about what's coming next Wednesday uh, another interview with another author and while that this is playing do drop down any questions you have for Ben. Uh, I can see there's still a good 30 or so people watching. So uh, do uh, drop any questions, anything you, else you want to, to add. And then we'll come on to Ben's books. Uh, there are a series of a, a couple of other books I just quickly want to talk about. And uh, we'll then start to wrap it up. So this is what's coming next week. On Wednesday, the 25th of November, I'm going to be talking with mountaineer, climber and editor Alex Roddy regarding the gorgeous new coffee table book, Wanderlust Europe, The Great European Hike, published by Gestalt in Books. From the temperate climbs of the Spanish islands, over the Nordic fjords and to the summit of Alpine peaks, Wanderlust Europe points the reader in the direction of the continent's most awe-inspiring routes. This is a stimulating manual for hikers of all skill levels in pursuit of breathtaking beauty and a sense of freedom. I'll also have a copy to give away on the night, but you must be watching to win it. So join me and Alex on the Outdoors Station YouTube channel at 7pm Wednesday the 25th of November to hear more stories about these fabulous routes. So that's what's coming uh, next uh, Wednesday. So join us again at uh, same time, 7 o'clock, all being well next Wednesday. Uh, and questions, there haven't been many questions coming through at the moment, which is fine. So what we'll do is we'll have a look at uh, some of uh, Ben's other books, which I'm sure he can tell us a bit about. Now, he's, he's obviously getting a reputation for books with great backstories and uh, just like Grandma Gatewood's. So tell us a few things about uh, a few of the other books that can be found. And Rose will drop the links into the chat room for everybody. Uh, sure. So uh, The Man Who Walked Backward is a story of a guy named Plenty Wingo, who is a, a Texan who decided in 1931 on the front end of the Great Depression that he would try to walk backward around the world. And it's a uh, fun uh, rollick through Depression era uh, America and Europe. Uh, the Leper Spy is about a woman who was, uh, um, who was a spy for the U.S. during World War II. And she was good because she had leprosy. And the Japanese, during their occupation of her home, home city of Manila, um, were uh, afraid uh, culturally, uh, horribly afraid of contracting contagious disease. And so she was able to do these really intrepid and life-saving spy missions because uh, she was suffering from um, a disease. And then uh, lastly, the book that comes out January 25th, coming right up, A Shot in the Moonlight. It tells the story of a, a man named George Denning who was born into slavery in southwestern Kentucky and uh, eventually um, defends himself from attack from a lynch mob that had showed up at his house one night in 1897 to try to chase him and his family off. And he killed one of the one of the would-be lynchers and was convicted for that and then pardoned by the governor for that and then sued the lynch mob in court. 
in a very sensational case that has been largely forgotten in American history, where a black man uh, was successfully sued for damages, a lynch mob that had tried to kill him. <laughs> Miles away there, staring at the screen. Um, sounds sounds really good. We, I think we've got uh, one question that's come through. I've lost it. Where is it now? Um, uh, it was about the hydration. Here we go. From Dave Fowler. Um, I'd love to know what Emma did about hydration. I guess water sources were safer then, but did she carry any water in any way, or was it fresh flowing water commonly available? Yeah, so I know she carried a canteen and she would often fill it up in streams, um, uh, freshwater streams and springs. And the water was, uh, uh, you know, certainly more pure in 1955. There's less development around uh, around the Appalachian Trail. Uh, so that's highly discouraged now, of course. But um, she drank fresh water and occasionally she would, you know, fill up her canteen at someone's outdoor spigot. Uh, so she was getting municipal water, purified water from a spigot that way, but uh, great question. And I don't, I'm not sure I addressed the first one on the screen about why not why not wear a backpack. I don't know if I know the answer to that, except to say that, you know, it might not have been within a reach. Uh, those, those packs, even the steel frame outside, external frame packs that like Earl Schaefer carried, um, I'm not sure that was, I'm not sure she could afford that to begin with, and I'm not sure, that would have been something that she would have found comfortable. There's no mention that she ever tried one of those on or that anybody uh, gave her that type of gear to play with. Um, she just liked that bag that she could sling over her shoulder. I think it was comfortable for her. It balanced on her shoulder well. Um, there is one experience. She climbed Mount Hood. When she finished uh, the Oregon Trail at Portland, Oregon, there was a local club that wanted to take her up Mount Hood for a climb up uh, this this beautiful high peak in, uh, in in the state of Oregon, not far from Portland. And they equipped her with all the cutting edge gear. They got her new hiking boots and rain gear, and they all took this hike together. And she made it about halfway up the mountain before she said, I don't wanna do this anymore. And she turned back around and came, left the club, the hikers, and came back to the bottom. And uh, I, I have reason to believe that it was primarily, she didn't like it because she was wearing all this new gear. It was the first time that she'd ever worn hiking boots so far as I can tell. And I don't think she liked it. I think she just, she was a simple person, wanted, you know, canvas keds on her feet, uh, a, a denim flexible bag on her shoulder. And, um, and that was about all, you know, that was about all she needed. I've often thought I would, you know, I should I should try to recreate a long hike using just the gear that she she brought. I'm not sure if I'm brave enough to do it, but uh, maybe I should I should put that on my list. Excellent, fantastic. And uh, we've had one other comment from the, the Flying Sprout, for which for some reason not coming through, but basically uh, saying, inspirational woman, fantastic story told, Ben. Great show, thanks, Ben, Bob, and Rose. Well, I think that's pretty well it, everybody. Thank you very much for staying with us. It's been a long show, but I hope it's been an entertaining show and something a bit different for a Wednesday night here in very dull, miserable the UK and hopefully pass some time for people over in the US as well. Uh, I just want to say thanks very much indeed to Ben. Uh, the links to his books in the UK and in the US are in the chat uh, that Rose has put in there. And hopefully we will talk at a later stage when he has another book, which will be stimulating for, for outdoors people. So thanks very much indeed for your time, Ben. And uh, I hope you have a, a good afternoon. Thank you, Bob. And let me just uh, invite anybody, if you're coming to hike in the U.S., uh, drop me a line. You can find me on the Internet. Drop me a line and let me know. And maybe I'll be out there. I'd love to, uh, I'd love to meet uh, you know, anybody who appreciates the outdoors. Just say hello. That's awesome. And thanks, thanks very so much indeed, Ben. Me. Lovely. No problem at all. I look forward to it. Take care of yourself, Ben, and all the best. Happy hiking. Cheers.